Good afternoon. My name is Eric Schillingford, as is what he said. I'm a development control officer at the Physical Planning Division. My role here this afternoon is to discuss planning. I hope that the information that we will give will be able to guide you on that very important path of home ownership. For those of us who already have a home, one of these days you might be thinking in terms of refurbishment and extension and the like. Now the Physical Planning Division is the Department of Government that is responsible for the development of lands in Dominica. By the Physical Planning Act number no. 5 of 2002, we are mandated to, as you could tell, an act to make provisions for the orderly and progressive development of land in both urban and rural areas and to preserve and improve the amenities thereof for the grant of permission to develop land and for other powers of control under the use of land, for the regulation of the construction of buildings and related matters, to confer additional powers in respect of the acquisition and development of land for planning purposes and for other matters connected herewith. In short, the planning division by an act of parliament is responsible for the development of land. Let's go. The physical planning division codes. Uh, the, we have the building code. And the building code was developed by the OECS. And what, what we, it did is that we've since adapted it to suit the Dominica situation. So the code allows for the physical planning division authorities with the tools needed for examination of development proposals. So when you submit a plan to build, be it a residential structure, commercial structure, an institutional structure, or even for the development of land, the requirements of the building code govern the construction of all buildings where as the building guidelines are for use. So we have the building code and we also have the building guidelines. So the building guidelines are for the use of the design and construction of simple buildings, such as private dwellings and small retail shops of less than 3,000 square feet in gross area. Designers and contractors of building outside the scope of the guidelines was consulted the building code for the relevant design and construction requirements. The mission statement of my department to function as a pivotal driver of sustainable development and transformation in the Commonwealth of Dominica and our vision statement a transform sustainable green economy and country by the year 2030. The key officials of my ministry, we have Minister the Honorable Dr. John Colin McIntyre who is our Minister, Permanent Secretary Mrs. Gloria Joseph and Chief Physical Planner Mr. Kelvin Ruler. Now, in terms of the application review process, you submit an application to the planning division. That you would have a payment of fees, an application fee based on the structure you want to build, based on the floor area you want to build, acknowledgement of the, of the application, the plans are checked. Now, based on the, on, on the construction type you want to undertake. Say, for example, you want to build an institutional building, a church. An application like a church, it will go through the normal planning process. It, the plans will be checked for correctness. We would have an engineering input. It would have to be referred to the fire department, the environmental, the health department, which will take care of fire concerns, fire protection and prevention, and the environmental health, sewage, wastewater disposal, and the likes. In certain situations, drawings would have to be referred to additional agencies for input in terms of reviewing, doing a complete review of the application. Then once the plans are ready, ready for submission, it would go to a meeting where a decision would be taken. Now, bigger applications like churches, supermarkets, and the like, they would go to what we call a technical committee made out of professionals, not, also not really working at the planning division, who would do an independent review of those plans. The smaller dwelling houses, which might interest the most of you here, would be approved in-house. Can you? Subdivision of lands. Now, when you will have embarked on the whole process or you plan to embark on the process of building or developing land to build that all-important home, that home we will do only once in our lifetime. One of the most, the first most important steps is the acquisition, acquisition of land. Now, there can be a major stumbling block in terms of that process. What I will do at this stage is that we have with us, Mr. Keith Stevens, who is a physical planner at my department. I will let him go through that process with you. So, Mr. Stevens. Uh, 
Okay, my name is Keith Stevens, a physical planner at the physical planning division. I want to thank Mr. Eric Schillingford for his um, um, initiation of the presentation. Um, with regards to the subdivision of lands, it is always pertinent and important that any person that is interested in developing their property or interested in building their own home before even purchasing the land should come to the physical planning department to find out um, which of the subdivisions are authorized and those that are not authorized. Too often at times that persons go ahead and um, purchase lands only to find out in the long run that the land is part of an illegal subdivision, which in turn would delay their application process. So they will not be able to get approval for their building plans until the person that they purchase the land from has an approved or authorized subdivision. So it's always important to call the planning department to find out um, which of the subdivisions are authorized and those that are not authorized. Um, for developers here, if you plan on subdividing land, then you would need to go through the, the process. Uh, you need to obtain a survey plan and a certificate of title. You need to have those readily available. Discuss the intentions with your family members. Make sure that everybody is in agreement as to how you plan on subdividing the land. Um, discuss the subdivision with a surveyor. And you can even have an input preliminary with physical planning to give your surveyor an idea as to how he can go ahead to do a better job, so to speak. And you think, think long term and check with the physical planning division for development. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Okay. The kind of uses, okay, you also have to find out the kind of uses that are available for your particular area. Um, we do have we do have a, a national physical development plan, and there are areas that are zoned for particular uses. So you don't want to purchase land for your residential home that is designated for industrial use or for agricultural use. So it is always good to find out uh, what land uses exist where. A typical example um, in Warner, for example, we have um, it's a residential area. Partly residential, partly agricultural. The residential area, there are minimum lot sizes. And persons think that they can go ahead and just purchase a lot in one of, of let's say, 5,000 or 3,000 square feet. But because of the studies that were carried out, we have decided to add the physical planning department and made it policy that the minimum lot size for Warner is 10,000 square feet. And a lot of you may have already known that. The reason for that is because the topsoil, the Topsoil is very limited, and uh, percolation and absorption is very scarce. Um, and this will in turn disturb or create, create pollution with your sewage disposal system. So if you have a larger lot, and if you have a larger lot, then you can distribute, you can distribute or have a designed sewage disposal for your lot, okay? Yeah, so it speaks to lot density for the applicable areas, the minimum lot sizes, the soil type, and the character of the area. Yes. Preparing for a subdivision plan, the, the different uses that, that exist, the commercial, institutional, recreational, the lot dimensions, you need, to find, you need to have all that on your subdivision plans. And these are just uh, a checklist of what a subdivision plan should entail so that it can go through the process uh, smoothly. I wouldn't go through everything. This is more so for the surveyor that is submitting the, the subdivision on behalf of the client. Okay? Next slide. Uh, the plans must be checked for the re relevant agencies. Ag Environmental Health of the Wasco, Dominic Agricultural Department. These are some of the agencies that we generally refer plans to um, on a needs basis. However, environmental health, almost each and every plan has to go to environmental health. And um, for example, for subdivision, then it will have to go to the WASCO so that they can do the calculations as to the type and diameter of your cold water feed. And for Domlek to give you the estimates of your, electri your electricity to that property, how much it will cost you 
to bring electricity to your property. Okay? And, and so forth. Next slide. What is the meaning of a subdivision? Some people come to the office and say, my uncle just gave me a piece of land and that is not subdivision. But in the act, it, it clearly states that, and I will read, that a subdivision means the division of a parcel of land other than buildings held under one ownership into two or more parts. Whether such division is by conveyance, transfer, assignment, vesting order, plan of survey, plan of subdivision, or any other instrument of the purpose of sale, gift, partition, succession, lease, mortgage, or for any other purpose. And I want to reiterate that, 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 that part of the um, definition. For the purpose of sale, for the purpose of gift, partition, success, lease. Once somebody is gifting you a portion of land from a whole, it is considered a subdivision as a family member or otherwise. The land subdivision is the first step in the process of community development, right? Once land has been divided into streets, lots, blocks, and publicly recorded, the correction of defects is costly and difficult. Subdivision of land sooner or later becomes a public responsibility in, in that streets must be maintained and various services must be provided. We do have a little um, concern with quote unquote developers. A developer in, let's say, a more developed country would have the um, funds to I install or to bring in the services that is, that is needed for, for, for occupancy. But here in Dominica and maybe in the Caribbean and the region, most developers, quote unquote, because I have two acres of land, I can subdivide it and provide 10 lots, cut roads and throw some tarish on it, and then I sell to anybody that wants to buy. After which, you don't see me, I go to, I go to vacation in Italy and I use all of your money. But we, we, we need to devise, we need to devise a framework where we can hold these developers responsible for, for, for installing your proper roads, sidewalks, bringing in the electricity, because they do charge you for that. They charge you for that and you don't get that. And at most times, the government has to come in and bring, bring in the services for you. Or at times, you might have to pay them like 50 or $60,000 to bring electricity to your lot. So these are some of the setbacks or concerns that we have at the physical planning department. Public health and safety and welfare is thereby affected in many important respects. It is therefore in the interest of the public, the developer, and the future owners of the subdivisions be conceived, designed, and developed in accordance with the regulations governing the subdivision of land within the Commonwealth of Dominica and the land use plan. Okay, next slide. Checklist for final planning permission. I will now pass it on to the development control officer, Mr. Eric Schillingford, as he will elaborate on that for you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to thank you, Mr. Stephen, for your presentation. And I cannot overemphasize the need for when you will have purchased lands from, and I talk, I'm talking about service lands, one of the first steps, come, come into the department, ask questions as to whether or not it's in an authorized scheme. When you will have purchased service land, you must insist that the developer provides those services, all weather road, portable water, electricity, telephone and the like. And do not fall into the trap of having any developers tell you that they will sell you raw land. Because sometimes the service price for land might be $8 a square foot in a particular location. Now the developer might say to you that, I will sell those lands to you at $3, $4 a square foot. But once you will have built your dream home, and then those services, you need them so bad, it will cost you much more to provide it. So besides that, you will be doing an illegal act by purchasing those lands in an illegal subdivision and over the years, we've seen people so frustrated because their dream all of a sudden it cannot become a reality by virtue of the fact that they cannot get planning permission because they bought land in an illegal subdivision. They will have gone through the process, 
paid an architect or draftsman to provide those drawings, and then they got blocked. So I'd just like to offer that word of caution to you again. Now we are moving on. Checklist for final planning permission. Now final planning permission is required for all development projects. And when we say all development projects, we're talking, while we, we want to concentrate on the buildings, but there are different types of, of development permission. When you, see, when you pass around the island and you see a quarry, for example, in operation, that quarry will have to apply for and get planning permission. When you see a commercial building, they need planning permission. When, even when somebody puts up a banner, they need to apply for planning permission. So there are different types of planning permission. The, atta the attached checklist contains all the necessary information required by the physical planning division for planning consideration. This differs from outline planning permission, which is required for small projects. Large scale projects and other categories of uses are outlined in Schedule 11 of the Act and do not require outline planning permission. Now, outline planning permission for certain proposals, by virtue of the level of uncertainty, you're not sure whether or not that particular proposal will be approved in that particular locality. So you do not want to go ahead and to pay an architect or an engineer thousands of dollars to do a complete design for you just to find out that you will not receive planning permission. So outline planning permission is more like testing the waters to see whether or not I can put that gun factory next to the church or I can put a church and that is one of the most common ones, a church in a residential neighborhood. But as I tell people, a church is part of a community. Most people, they do not want a church next to the building, only if it's their church. Even a pub or some other things, they are part of a community. Checklist for reviewing building plans. And that more concerns the development control officers at my office. So when you will have gone to the bank, the bank will have told you you can afford a building of $100,000. And I'm happy that the bank mentioned it to you because I'll tell you why. People come, we all have our dream house. And I always say to persons, we want a free bedroom house. Every boy bedroom must have its own bath. We have a nice balcony. We might even have a pad and our little helicopter pack on our pad and while we're out there, we're looking out and our yacht is on the sea and we're happy. But reality sets in. Can we afford it? Most times the answer is no. People go ahead, they come up with the elaborate designs, massive buildings, and just to find out, they do the estimates. They will have paid the architect, they will have paid the engineer, they will have paid the quantity surveyor, maybe come up and, uh, and is somebody trying something. And maybe their bill at that stage would have come up to maybe $7,000, $8,000. Reality sets in, the bank tells them, no, you cannot afford it. And they have to come back to planning division and might end up with a little two-bedroom starter unit. No, a two-bedroom starter unit is not a bad thing because you need to be sheltered. You're tired of paying rent. You need to start somewhere. So you come with a starter unit. And that's what you can afford. The bank will work with you and so so just a word of caution. Now, once you will have done that exercise, you get your draftsman or your architect to provide those drawings. Now, they must, they must prepare those plans for you based on the requirements of the building code. For example, it doesn't make sense in this day and age that you design a building and you can't turn in the bedroom. That you design a building where in a tropical country an adequate provision was not made for natural light and ventilation, so you're always hot in that bedroom. And we try to be as energy efficient as possible. So the draftsman would expect him to provide the minimum window size based on our building code, which stands at about 15% of the floor area of a particular room, so adequate light and, and, and ventilation. So you would have a completed application form, which is provided by the planning division. You would have proof of ownership, which is your certificate of title, or if you've just purchased the land, something like a memorandum of transfer. You would have one copy of your survey plan of the land which you will have purchased, and your plans. Now, all plans must be submitted in triplicate. Let's go. What are the planning fees? Now, the planning fees are based on the size of the structure. It will tell you 
So say for example, you build in a normal two bedroom house, most likely you'll pay $50, because that would be most likely below 1,000 square feet. However, they are small and they are big, one bedroom or two bedroom houses, based on what you, you require. Proof of ownership, I've already explained that. Can I apply to build a property that is not in my name? Yes, you could do that because the, the owner of the property could give you documentation to say that they're giving you permission to develop those lands. So that can be done. How long will the physical plan review process take? That's a very good question. And most folks, they seem to get frustrated by that part of it. A lot of times we take flack, but it's not our fault. If you get a good architect, a good draftsman, you've provided the minimum lot size we, 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 we figure that works. It's 2,500 square feet. Minimum lot size for Grand Savannah, seven. Yeah, 7,000 7, square feet. Well, Picard, <laughs> 5,000 square feet, yeah. Uh, well, I, I spoke about, about Pocassian, so, okay, what is the minimum lot size for commercial or industrial? It, 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 it varies, because what I would say about commercial or industrial lots, with ventures like this, you have to think down the road in terms of, if my business is doing well, the potential for expansion, so that could determine a minimum lot size. Yes, sir. Okay, we spoke about the building setbacks, the front setbacks, the side setbacks, and the rear setbacks, and the minimum setbacks. Uh, in terms of the preparation of subdivision plans, as Mr. Stevens explained, for example, if you have a, a corner lot, you would appreciate that it would need to be a much bigger lot by virtue of the fact it's fronting two roads. So 10 feet from one road, 10 feet from the other road, and 10 feet at the back, right away, you need, a, you need a much bigger lot. So in terms of purchasing lots, even from an approved subdivision, you would have to ensure that whatever it is I plan to build, whatever building I need to provide for my family, then that lot can adequately take it. I think that's explained already. So let's move to the next slide. Yes. So th this part deals with subdivision, and so uh, in terms of the design of roads, call the sacks, turning points and the like, the minimum dimensions. Let's go. Okay, final plans check out. To complete an application for planning permission of building works, the file and associated plan should contain the following information. As I said, completed application form, proof of ownership, a certificate of title, an allocation letter, from housing. So in the event where you purchase land from government and you, you don't already have a title, so the housing manager, what he will do is that he'll provide an allocation letter for you. Uh, a letter from the owner of the land witnessed by someone. No, we, we've kind of moved away from that because what we want is either a copy of the certificate of title receipt or an MOT, memorandum of transfer. Because by the time you will have purchased that lot, you, you can get an MOT from a lawyer. Let's go, please. A copy of your survey plan to which the application relates. So the land, what we normally call the land paper, a location plan. Now, in terms of the drawings, I'll just run through this. A location plan. When you will have submitted your drawings to planning, I need to know where will I find your plot of land. So on that location plan, it will say it's next to Mr. Edwards' house, or it's next to the Arawak House of Culture. So it can assist me in terms of visiting the site, environmental health, visiting the site, and so. The site plan is your land paper or your lot plan with valuable information on there. So it would give the outline of the building that you propose to build. It will provide for the, set, the necessary setbacks. It will also provide for your sewage disposal, and in situations where you've bought land and the land slopes a lot, it would have topographical information as to your contours and whatever. So right away, you'd give an idea as to how many floors you're going to be. Let's go. All plans must be submitted in triplicate, as we said earlier, and drawings, with the exception of a location plan, must be drawn to scale. Front side and set setbacks using dimension lines, distance between the proposed building and thing. Yeah front side setbacks using dimension lines, distance between the proposed building and existing building. There are certain situations where you will have a large enough lot 
and there's already an existing building on the land and you want to build that second building. You need a minimum distance between buildings of eight feet. Now that is for privacy reasons, but more so fire protection and prevention. Because that distance, in case one building is ablaze, it prevents the fire from easily spreading to the next building. Yeah. Names of adjoining property owners, North Point, access to site, any other relevant information specifications. We spoke about the floor plan. The floor plan will give you all information in terms of it. It, it must be designed based on the building code. And it will give relevant information as to the number of rooms, the sizes of those rooms, the location of windows and doors. And at that stage of the game, that is the part that will excite you. That is one of the things that will excite you the most. As to how many rooms you have your play. You want to see the floor plan. As to how many rooms, is it next to my, do I have a master bedroom? Do I have a veranda? Is it an open floor concept? The other part that will excite you, and we'll get to it, is the elevations, because we want to see how our house will look, because we want it to look prettier, prettier than our neighbor's house, and that kind of thing. Let's go. The foundation plan. Mr. Mr. Trotter spoke about that today and uh, earlier on, and it will give information as to the spacing of the columns, foundation block work, size of columns, size of the footings and all, all that, dimensioning uh, uh, and relevant information so that the, whoever the contractor is, he can do a good job. The information is readily available so he can do a good job in terms of translating your dream into reality. Let's go. The elevations, I spoke about that. Uh, let's go again. The roof plan. Now the roof plan, it will give the overall dimensions of the wood, how big the roof is, the size and type and spacing of all members. If it's a timber roof, so it will tell you if it's two by six at what spacing, the purlins, what type of roof covering and so. The slope of the roof, the length of the overhang. Mr. Trotter mentioned all those things early on. Yeah. The cross section of the building. Now the, what the cross section does is it more establishes one of the main things it does, it establishes heights, and it also gives a description of the different materials to be used at different parts of the house. So for example, if you were to take a cross section through this building right through here, so it would cut through this window, so it would tell you the height of the window, the height of the window above the floor level, what material the floor is made out of, what material the roof is made out of. So basically, that's the information you'd get on the cross section, but it is very relevant information that the builder will use to construct your residence. Let's go. Beams, framing plan. Yeah. Let's go again, please. Okay, details to be taken at all critical sections of the building. So you'd have foundation details. You'd have details of stiffeners, your ring beam, your roof detail. The fixing of the roof is very important. And so the beam details as to how it is reinforced, the slab detail as to how it is being reinforced. And so, so all those details are very critical in terms of those things. Yeah. Foundation and retaining walls, as I, as I said earlier, I explained that earlier on. Let's go, please. Floor slab on grid. Uh, basically, in layman's term, you're building flat on the ground then. So you need to know the thickness of the slab. We need to know what type of reinforcement you put in the slab, BRC, or if you're using any other type of reinforcement. The support of the slab at uh, uh, points of detail, thickness of blinding, the damp proofing material. Because when you're building on the ground, the damp proofing material, it's important that you put what you see when you go on a construction site as the plastic. Okay, the damp, that is the polyfin, the damp proofing material. So it prevents damp penetration from the ground. So later on, your, 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 your floor is not too cold and, and that kind of thing. Thickness of hardcore, hardcore is the fill material. And it is very important that you use the correct type of material for your hardcore. Because in terms of, of compaction, uh, again, the engineer spoke about that early on. Yeah, let's go. Uh, size of columns and beams and whatever, Let, we can go again. We can go suspended slabs, the slab thickness, position of beams, and whatever. We can go again. Ring beam. Now, the, the ring beam is that important member. When you will have put up all the blocks and whatever, and 
That is the member you use to tie all the block work and tie all the corners and whatever. It's very important because what it does is it, it ensures strength and stability to the structure, but it also creates the platform for you to put your wall plate. Now, with that wall plate is that timber member that you see that is bolted on top of it uh, so that it can receive the roof. I'm telling you this, these things because from early o'clock, if you're armed with this information, while you're not a builder, while you're not a technical person, but by making frequent checks when your building is under construction, you can already start to appreciate, A, hey, this guy is missing out on certain things. He's not doing certain things correctly. So that's why I'm, I'm giving you this information so you get an appreciation as to what goes into a building. There are steps, the number of risers and landings, now the risers, every time you step up, that is the riser, the tread is what you have to step up. So now, we know as we come of age and we have different ailments, we might not be able to face those steps again. The least somebody can do for us is at least make sure that this step is comfortable enough. So the step has to be at a particular pitch. The thickness of the, of the, of the, of the step it, and size arrangement and spacing of it, it, it talks to the, the strength of that step. Yeah, we can go again. Okay, the electricity plan, very important. Electricity can be a matter of life and death. That is one thing I don't play with at all. So in terms of the type and location of lighting fixtures and switches, you go, your house is under construction, or even in looking at the plan, basic things you could pick up, and you see that the, the, the draft person or the architect has placed a switch or an outlet underneath a window close to a water point and whatever. You could ask questions about that because that is right away, that is a danger area. During construction, you see that the electrician is doing certain things that were not on the plan or that could cause you to be in arms way. You could ask questions about that. So the type and the location of the fixtures, there are certain outlets that we allow in bathroom, in water areas and so, like a shaver, for example. But it has to be so designed that it cannot cause you harm. The door swings, very important. Location of your main switch. You want your main switch in a particular area of your house where anybody can just walk into your house and turn off your main switch to rob you. But at the same time, it must be strategically located that the in, in the event of a fire or some other mishap that you can access it easily. In, in the past, we've seen situations where people, they do not want to see the main switch, so they put it in a cupboard. Now, in a panic situation, in the middle of the night, you wake up in the darkness and so on, a fire has started and you want to turn off, one of the first things, you want to turn off the main switch, and you cannot access it. Let's go. The plumbing plan, another very important consideration because those of us who've lived in houses and our planning arrangement starts acting up, we know how much it can bother us. We do not want leaks and whatever, so it should be done properly. So the arrangement type of fixture in washrooms and kitchen, water lines to all fixtures, waste lines from all fixtures, size of water lines and waste lines, sources of supply, all other necessary information. Okay, again, it, the, the plans and the installation must be done based on code, and it has to be done by a competent plumber. Let's go. The drainage plan, size and arrangement of pipes, location, sizes of manual, location of septic tank, if any, location of effluent, disposal, fill, soak away, size, type, and arrangement of storm surface water. So that, what it, it seeks to do is you will have, most times you'll have discharge from your roof. You'll have roof water. You want to make sure that once that water comes from the roof, it does not affect your whole property so it is properly channeled and it does not go to my property because of the fact that I'm downhill for you, but it's adequately channeled to the next public drain or whatever. Yeah, let's go again. Special information, septic tank, bioreferral, septic tank socorro, bioreferral system. We send the drawings to environmental health. So environmental health will determine the size of your septic tank, the size of your look of your the, the 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 location of the septic tank soak away based on soil, soil conditions. Now, I, I, I'm one who always say that to people. There is one function that we all must go through with. 
And once we do it, we don't want to deal with it again. But too many times in the construction of a building is either the builder or the homeowner do not take enough pay at enough attention to the construction of the sewage disposal system. And then you find plungers in houses, you find FJ plumbing have to come back and pump it out. So that is a very, very important aspect of the whole planning process of the whole construction process. Engineer certificate is required based on, on, on the type of flaws you're going up. So say, for example, because of your tearing, you're going to find yourself in a free flow situation or you do not want too many columns, so you have beam spanning in excess of 16 feet. You need an engineer's input. So an engineer would have to sign off on that. Besides that, sometimes you find that the engineer's input, although you would have paid the engineer maybe $2,000 or I don't know how much, but by virtue of the fact he was able to design that particular structure for you, it costs you more during the construction. It costs you less during the construction phase. We heard that from Mr. Trott again earlier on today. And you'll see the different, the different classification of, of structures and so that might need that. Okay, seven critical stages during the construction phase. And I've set out only a few of them. Now, it's very important that you will receive a, a, an approval letter from Physical Planning Division which will outline the different phases based on our building code. It's in your interest that you contact the Planning Division to ensure that we do checks on all of the stages. We've had, we have setting out, for example, that's where when you've cleared your land and the builder will have come and put the batter board. We've had situations in the past where people build on the wrong lot, people build half of the building on, on somebody else's lot, and while, if I were to come on your site and you tell me that is your lot, and I ask you, are you sure? If I do not see the boundary points, I'll ask you to reestablish them. Sometimes people are reluctant to pay a survey of $600. But can you imagine you being so smart not wanting to pay a survey of $600 and you're foolish enough to put a $500,000 house on the wrong lot? So this is a very important thing. The foundation set out, the floor set up roof fixing and other things, these lend to the structural integrity of the building. You would not want soon after you will have built that structure, you start seeing cracks because it was not done properly, the builder make a shortcut and whatever. And I remember when we were doing the advertisement of this event, because we partnered with the bank, we were on DBS, we were on, well I did not go on Kyrie, but we were on the hot seat to promote this event. And in doing that, I remember, I remember clearly, I said to, to, to somebody that sometimes the people who are supposed to really come to those events, a lot of them don't turn out. I expected to see a lot of builders here today. And it's a partnership. And NBD did put out a strong team. And I say team because it's not me as planning against the person that's trying to build a house or it's not the builder against the person, or it's not NBD trying to hold back the person. It's a team effort. And the more that team can move in a kind of harmonious way, it's better for you, for continuity. You do not want halfway down the road, you have to fire the builder. The new builder has to start the process all over, and time is money. So every, when you will have received your approval letter, it's good that you inform planning at every stage what you're going to do. We'll check the reinforcement and make sure. Now, my department is physical planning division at Free Charles Avenue. It's just across the road from us. It's on the way to the hospital after Aid Bank, before the Pentecostal Church. Telephone numbers 266 375 13752, our email address, physical planning at dominica.gov.dm, and we have a website. Let's go. Yeah, thank you. Questions, comments? Yeah.